thanks to Ben for the invitation to deliver the George Richardson lecture this year, the 300th anniversary of the death of William Penn. I will confess to having developed a bit of an obsession with Penn um, over the past several decades. I blame this not, uh, in, in no small part to my having grown up in Pennsylvania, gone through the Pennsylvania public school system. And so tonight provides me with a really wonderful opportunity to inflict my personal obsession on all of you. Um, my students even have noticed this. My student uh, evaluation, uh, one of my student evaluations recently said, and I'm quoting here, he is quite passionate about William Penn. <laughs> Has many anecdotes. Um, and so I will um, try to live up to that. Um, I must say too that in preparing these remarks tonight, uh, I've been delighted to really learn uh, more about George Richardson and really the Richardson family, which is, I highly uh, recommend to you, a, a wonderful and remarkable um, set of men and women uh, um, in the 18th and 19th and 20th century. Um, it seems fitting as well to just point out, given my topic tonight, uh, that George Richardson himself was actually quite familiar with the work of William Penn. Both men entered the Quaker ministry in their mid-twenties. Uh, and Richardson records in his journal that during an early 1825 preaching tour uh, in Sheffield, I, re I revived the important Christian maxim inculcated by William Penn, no cross, no crown. And I think perhaps even more importantly, which was a complete surprise to me, which I promptly and excitedly uh, emailed Steve Angel and, uh, and Ben, uh, did you know that George Richardson actually wrote a book about William Penn? I have it in my hand for those of you who are skeptical. Um, in 1844, George Richardson gathered together selections from Penn's writing in a volume that he titled William Penn, His Own Interpreter, which he defended Penn's controversial work, The Sandy Foundation Shaken, uh, the 18, uh, 1668 polemic that landed, landed Penn in the Tower of London. Richardson praised ben, Penn's, uh, Penn's uh, <laughs> long life of beneficence and piety um, and insisted that Penn was, quote, firm in his belief of the great essential doctrines of Christianity. Uh, folks in the 17th century were less sure of that. That's why he ended up in the Tower of London uh, for writing the book. Um, although Richardson does admit that, quote, at times, the unreasonable conduct of many of his opponents excited in Penn's own mind indignant feelings. Those in the room tonight who have sampled 17th century religious polemic, to say nothing of the work of a young William Penn himself, may have some idea of what indignant feelings look like, and they spill onto the page. Now, um, in my most recent book, Liberty, Conscience, and Toleration, I describe Penn as a figure whom many know a little, but few know well someone who was at once both familiar and elusive. On this story in Gary Nash, in the endorsement on the flyer for the forthcoming biography, calls Penn the most important and least studied of the colonial founders. So I want to suggest this evening that William Penn's complex legacy is due not only to idiosyncratic personal factors and his considerable uh, intellectual and oratorical gifts and practical political skills, but also to his almost unique placement at the intersection of an extraordinary number of social, political, religious, and economic networks in early modern England, Europe, and America. Um, as, uh, as I heard many of the presentations today on leadership, on debt, these are all things that Penn knew something about. Um, he was a leader at times quite effectively, at, quite, at times quite disastrously, ineffectively, um, and he was very good at getting himself into debt. Um, he was much less good at getting himself out of debt. Um, so I want to start by highlighting a number of paradoxical elements of Penn's life and career as it played out between his Quaker convincement in 1667 and 1712 when he suffered the stroke that hobbled him both physically and mentally for the final six years of his life. And from there, I'll suggest that it was precisely his role as a boundary span, occupying a real nodal point, linking the Society of Friends, the broader dissenting community, the English government, and those engaged in the colonial and imperial project throughout the British Atlantic that led him to such significant, complicated, and contentious relationships with so many of his contemporaries. And so as we'll see tonight, I hope by the time we're finished, um, Penn's effort at, at boundary spanning were not always successful, but his peripatetic nature and his indefatigable energy for his causes propelled him into multiple arenas 
from his earliest preaching tour to the end of his active life 45 years later. So first, these four paradoxes. I'm going to open with these. I think they set the stage for a larger uh, reconsideration of Penn's <clears throat> complex life and legacy. Um, social, religious, political, geographical, and economic, financial, the, uh, the bottom one there particularly having to do with his indebtedness. Let me just look at these very quickly. First of all, egalitarian Quaker theology and hierarchical social expectations. William Penn lived with a sharp tension between egalitarian ideas on the one hand and hierarchical and deferential expectations on the other. As an influential member of the Society of Friends, Penn embraced, of course, as all of you know, a radically egalitarian theology that proclaimed human equality in the sight of God and the transformative power of the life within. As an outgrowth of this radical theology, again, well known to those of you in the room, Quakers upended social hierarchies, disdained conventional markers of social distinction, and of course found themselves on the receiving end of bitter condemnation and brutal punishment. And over the course of his long career as a Quaker controversialist, Penn never wavered from these theologically explosive tenets of Quakerism. Yet, as a prominent Englishman with a war, there's his father there on the top, with the war hero, member of parliament, and recipient of expropriated Irish lands for a father, Penn grew up expecting deference from others, consistently lived beyond his means, was never without servants, and even owned several slaves who worked on Pennsbury, his American estate. <clears throat> Much of his correspondence with Pennsylvanians uh, during his extended absences from the colony read like the fulminations of a disappointed parent at his wayward children, who he was utterly convinced, refused to subordinate their wills and express appropriate gratitude for all he had done on their behalf. Um, in fact, even as an as a illustration of the way these two different aspects, paradoxical aspects of his career, often sit right next to each other, when he wrote Great Case of Liberty of Conscience, arguably one of his most important works, first uh, edition of this published in Dublin, he was on a trip where interspersed through his Irish journal are him being thrown in jail for Quakerism and him driving very hard bargains uh, on the poor Irish who had to pay his father rent for land that, of course, had once been theirs. At the Murphy, this is a part of the story that I feel quite, <laughs> quite uh, keenly. Um, so there's that paradox. Secondly, a champion of popular institutions and mouthpiece for an autocratic king. During much of the 1670s, William Penn vocally defended popular institutions, including parliament and juries, as guarantors of the people's liberties. Of course, the Penn Mead trial, this is the famous the Quaker tapestry piece. Many of you are familiar with it. Um, this famous 1670 trial um, defending the rights of juries to render uncoerced verdicts was uh, really his entry point into uh, a major national career. <clears throat> Yet during the late 1680s, Penn was reviled, um, not without reason, uh, as King James II's mouthpiece, paid lackey of an absolutist monarch bent on destroying the rule of law by decreeing religious liberty, even, God forbid, for Catholics. Um, bad enough for Quakers, but for Catholics. Now, Penn, in his own mind, reconciled these three commitments to representative institutions, to the liberty of conscience, and to the king's program by insisting that the king's declaration be followed by parliamentary approval. This is what he called a new Magna Carta for liberty of conscience. This was a theoretically coherent, plausible position, although in the midst of the 1688 political unrest, we might not be surprised if its nuances escaped some of uh, the skeptics out there who saw James II uh, as an existential threat to religious liberty. So there's the, the hierarchy and egalitarianism paradox. There's the popular institution and defense of monarchy um, paradox. There is what I'll call the uh, American colonizer uh, and the absentee landlord paradox. A few months after his arrival, it's one of my favorite pieces of Penn's correspondence. A few months after his arrival in Pennsylvania, Penn wrote back to a correspondent, quoting here, I am mightily taken with this part of the world. I like it so well that my family being once fixed with me, and if no other thing occur, I am like to be an adopted American. <clears throat> I like this passage so much, I actually su uh, suggested to Oxford Press um, that an adopted American would be a great title for this biography, though you might notice that it's not titled that. Um, 
we were, the, the New York Oxford office and myself were really quite sold on this until the marketing meeting happened and it was pointed out that there may be a UK audience for whom an adopted American might not be the most effective way to sell books. And so then they suggested, well, what would you think of William Penn, A Life? <laughs> I thought, well, it sounds rather boring to me, but this is sort of what they do. They tell you what your book's going to be called. And um, I didn't have a good comeback other than it bores me slightly. Um, and so we went ahead with that. Anyhow, I still love this idea of adopted American. Penn, when he came to America, he threw himself enthusiastically into the business of founding, attempting to harmonize the political theorizing he had done in England with conditions on the ground in America. But some, as he puts it, other thing, of course, did occur. Legal disputes with his southern neighbor, Lord Baltimore, which drew him back to England just two years after his arrival. Later repercussions from his involvement uh, in English politics during the late 1680s. And so in all, he spent just about four of his remaining 36 years in America. Soon became a stranger to his own settlers, um, and was laid to rest here, of course, in Jordans, uh, far from Philadelphia. And there he remains, despite an ill-fated and unsuccessful attempt to repatriate Penn's remains in 1881, which you can read about in the epilogue of the biography when it comes out, uh, or you can go uh, online and have a look. There was a great idea that Philadelphians thought to bring Penn's remains back for the bicentennial of his arrival in 1882. Um, they sent a representative um, only they had forgotten to ask the Jordan's friends before making this journey. Um, and so after six unhappy weeks in uh, London, Philadelphia lawyer George Harrison, and I just also love that his name is George Harrison, um, uh, returned to Pennsylvania empty-handed and Penn uh, remains in Jordan's. Um, and then finally, final paradox, just open things off here, is of course thriving colony and bankrupt indebted colonizer. Um, Pennsylvania soon became a thriving center of American political, intellectual, economic, and religious life, a popular destination for emigrants, emigrants from across Europe, and a real crucial hub in the emerging British imperial economy, yet Penn was never able to reap these benefits. His eight-month imprisonment uh, in Fleet Prison for debt in 1708 <clears throat> provides evidence of his chronic difficulties in managing money. It stemmed directly from his inability to take advantage of the economic potential of American colonization. Not to mention, I must add, his inability or unwillingness to curtail his own standard of living. Um, there was actually a fairly straightforward way in which William Penn could have stayed out of debt. Um, we call it downsizing now. Um, but that simply was not on the table. Um, in fact, he bankrupted himself in the process of colonization, and he was actually attempting to sell Pennsylvania back to the crown when a stroke incapacitated him in 1712. It's a cruel, cruel story. He finally negotiated a 12,000 pound settlement, received 1,000 pounds, and three months later had a fatal stroke um, and spent the next six years um, uh, severely disabled. In fact, I suggest in the closing chapter of liberty, conscience, and toleration, that the dynamic growth of Pennsylvania actually took place precisely because of Penn's absences, rather than in spite of them. Um, that's a more complicated story I could go into in a minute. So appreciating the cumulative effect of these four paradoxes, I think, is essential <coughs> for understanding the complexity of Penn's career, but I want to use my time tonight to put them into a bit of a broader context. One way to understand these paradoxes is to acknowledge the many different roles that Penn played within the Society of Friends and in English, European, and American society more generally. During the 1670s, he participated as both a theorist and an activist in a vibrant restoration debate over the toleration of dissenters. Within the Society of Friends, he worked tirelessly in support of George Fox's gospel order, a model of leadership we heard a bit about earlier. A series of organizational innovations designed to present a united Quaker front to the outside world by disciplining wayward friends uh, and dissent within the society. During the early 1680s, his role as the proprietor and chief governing officer of an English colony in America added yet another dimension to his activism. Later in that same decade, as a close ally of James II, as I mentioned, Penn occupied the role of courtier, what Scott Sowerby calls, quote, the intellectual architect of the King's Toleration Project. <laughs> Uh, it was, of course, a royal policy that aroused a great deal of popular resistance, and I don't think it overstates the case 
say that, to say that his association with James in 1688 cast a pall of suspicion over Penn uh, for the rest of his life, three decades uh, later. During the 1690s and 1700s, he assumed a leading role among the various proprietors and colonial agents, both in London and America, seeking to maintain their autonomy as the crown sought to reassert control over its far-flung empire. And of course, Penn himself changed over the years. The young radical who rose to national fame in his 20s became, by the late 1680s, an ambitious insider, consummate insider in some ways, despite his status as a religious outsider, um, trying to achieve similar ends through the means at his disposal. By the early 1700s, the utopian visionary had become embittered and alienated from his own colonists, and as I mentioned, he was felled by a stroke just as he completed an agreement to sell government, his government back um, to the crown. So building on uh, some of these preliminary considerations, let me turn to this notion of Penn as a boundary spanner. Um, those of you who uh, work in, um, in the business field um, uh, may know this term. It's, of course, not a term that was in circulation during Penn's lifetime, so calling him a boundary spanner is a slight historical uh, anachronism. Boundary spanning is a relatively recent term. It's been widely used by scholars studying public health, social policy, research and development, entrepreneurship, organizational behavior, and really other arenas in which the gathering and communication of information is essential for successful outcomes. Boundary spanners are crucial to the effective functioning of groups of all sorts of kinds, which depend on well-placed members who can facilitate the flow of information both within the group and between the group and key external constituencies. The success of any individual boundary spanner depends on a variety of personal as well as structural factors, of course, uh, useful individual qualities, the ability to cultivate and draw on personal and professional social networks, and I would say perhaps most importantly, a fortuitous placement at the intersection of internal actors within a group and important sources of information outside. This is a brief two bullet point uh, summary of a, of a large literature that some of you in the room may know better than I do. Um, so in what ways then does it illuminate something about William Penn to see him as a boundary spanner? Which boundaries did he span? How does the concept of boundary spanning help us explain his significance, his controversial uh, significance in the development of Quakerism and in English and American history? I'm gonna spend the rest of my time trying to answer those questions. One point to make at the outset, I realize I keep saying at the outset before I actually get to this, but uh, one last introductory point um, is to acknowledge that many of the networks and connections that would enable Penn to become an effective boundary spanner were in place well before his Quaker convincement in 1667. It's some of the things that he brought with him into the Society of Friends. Although it was in the 1670s that he really came into his own as a Quaker controversialist, by the time he attended the Corp meeting that would so radically change his life, Penn's, or more accurately, his father, um, had already laid the foundation for an influential public career. He'd spent five years in Ireland as a youth, gone on to Christ Church, Oxford for two extremely unhappy years, and uh, was either asked to leave or withdrew, depending on whom you, which biography you read. Um, traveled to Europe with Robert Spencer, who later became Earl of Sunderland, and who would be Again, one of, the, one of the individuals who would enable Penn to engage in this boundary spanning later in his career. Studied at the Protestant Academy in Saumur, France. Entered Lincoln's Inn to study law, which was promptly closed by the plague. Um, ended his studies in law before they even began. Um, uh, and I'll refrain from any sort of lawyer joke there, but I, there's a lawyer joke crying out to be made. Um, a plague on lawyers or something like that. Um, uh, personally, personally carried messages about, about naval affairs between his father and King Charles II during the run-up to the Second Anglo-Dutch War, and traveled again to Ireland to negotiate leases with his father's tenants. So Penn was not, um, if there is an ordinary Quaker convert, he was not your ordinary Quaker convert. Um, he arrived in the Society of Friends groomed for, and in some ways expecting, a position of influence uh, in English society more generally. <coughs> so what I want to do then is um, spend some time uh, walking, us, walking ourselves through some of the big events of his career. I'm gonna spend most, most of my time talking about the 1670s, so that's really where it all gets laid into place. Um, but let me just sort of 
start here, um, and we'll, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. Um, following his celebrated 1670 trial and his October 1671 return from travels in Holland and Germany, William Penn began to assume the leading role in the Society of Friends that he would occupy for the rest of his life. Now, during the 1670s, attacks came from all sides, and Penn quickly became one of the prominent and the most prolific friends involved in interacting with a diverse range of audiences. Within the society, opposition to George Fox's authority erupted into a number of divisive movements, especially after the institutionalization of gospel order, which I'll talk about in a moment. Quakers also faced a hostile landscape of critics in both the dissenting and Anglican camps who questioned the Friends' doctrines and principles. And of course, they continued to need spokespersons who could articulate principled and pragmatic arguments against <coughs> persecution, which after all they were facing uh, nearly every day, to political authorities who held enormous power over their ability to survive in a hostile world. So well, that's what I have back here. Within the society, between the society and other religious groups, and between the society um, and government. Now as everyone in this room surely knows, either from their studies or their personal experience, the history of Quakerism, like that of any other religious body, is replete with instances of division and acrimony, despite its aspirations toward unity and consensus. And no one, I would argue, except perhaps Margaret Fell Fox, um, was as deeply committed to defending George Fox's leadership during these years as William Penn. He worked to get Fox released from prison in 1675. He routinely and, and repeatedly confronted dissenting Quake, Quakers uh, like William Mucklow and the Pennymans in both private correspondence and published works. He was among a group that the yearly meeting tasked in October 1675 to meet with the Story Wilkinson dissidents, whose fierce objections to Fox's leadership convulsed the society for much of the decade. Several years later, continuing that same effort, Penn convened a meeting with William Rogers, one of the leaders of the separatists in Bristol, whom he had known for years. Rogers was a prosperous Bristol merchant, um, and Penn had stayed in his home before he sailed for Cork in 1669, and he clearly assumed that familiarity would help him in some way. Um, but as he soon found out, familiarity does not ensure success. Sometimes it even breeds <coughs> contempt. Um, uh, the meeting was notoriously unsuccessful, and the schism persisted. Um, a few more comments um, about Penn's intra-Quaker boundary spanning. He was a key member of the morning meeting, which first met in September 1673, charged with organizing Quaker responses to their critics. And of course, to respond to critics, one has to know who those critics are, what they are saying. Um, and so at the very first meeting of, of the morning meeting, the very first session, William Penn and George Whitehead were specifically directed to obtain copies of all books. This is what the minutes say. All books written against friends. I mean, there are dozens upon dozens of them. Um, it's not reported <laughs> whether they actually found them all, but uh, it was no small task. Much of the morning meeting's work during these years involved assigning specific members to read and respond to specific anti-Quaker tracts. Um, Penn was hardly the only one uh, assigned to do this, but then again, given his prominence as a controversialist, he played an important role in these discussions and features prominently in the meeting's minutes and, and really wrote dozens upon dozens um, of responses, uh, of, of which I'll only mention just a few um, tonight. These years also saw the founding of the Meeting for Sufferings, sufferings there. Um, first convened in October 1675. Now Penn's membership in the Meeting for Sufferings both reflected his already existing social networks and facilitated further boundary spanning activities. <clears throat> the Meeting for Suffering soon took responsibility for organizing appeals to King and Parliament, as well as advocating with colonial proprietors who controlled territories where Quakers faced hostility or persecution. And again, he figures prominently in the meeting minutes here as well. He was one of a group sent to intervene with the governor of Jamaica on behalf of friends there. He was sent to the king to advocate for better treatment for friends in Barbados. <clears throat> he was sent to agents uh, of New England. There was no shortage of difficulty for friends in New England. Um, and along with James Claypool, who would later serve as treasurer of the Pennsylvania Society of Traders, Penn corresponded with Irish friends about the difficulties they faced there. <clears throat> He also worked um, with friends uh, beyond England and Ireland. He journeyed to Holland and Germany twice during the 1670s with Thomas, Rudford, uh, Thomas Rudyard and Benjamin Furley in 1671. 
and again in 1677, accompanying Fox and others to a general meeting of Dutch friends in Amsterdam. This Dutch meeting adopted a number of the elements of gospel order that Fox had been implementing in England and represented a significant step forward in the organization of Dutch friends along the same lines as English. And it was no less controversial among the Dutch friends as it had been among the English. Following that meeting, Penn traveled hundreds of miles um, with a number of friends, including Furley, George Keith, and Robert Barclay. And on both of his European trips, he laid the foundation for relationships that would later um, become instrumental in the success of his colonizing venture. So <clears throat> sort of as a way of kind of bringing this together, at the same time that he was arguing for religious liberty across English society, Penn was working with Fox to implement a kind of disciplinary structure um, within the Society of Friends and to control the face that Quakerism presented to the outside world. Now, far more public um, than his work in the Society of Friends, of course, were Penn's activities in spanning boundaries between friends and their adversaries. And there was no shortage of adversaries, um, external adversaries. This task picked up uh, after the king's, ironically perhaps, after the king's declaration of indulgence uh, in 1672, which provided a brief measure of religious liberty, but just about a year. Um, and if you really hate Quakers, but they're illegal, you don't have to see them because they're meeting in secret. If you really hate Quakers and they're illegal and they're meeting in, open, in the open, suddenly the floodgates of criticism, not surprisingly, um, open. Um, attacks came not only from Anglicans, but from other dissenters as well who saw friends as theologically misguided, politically subversive, and socially divisive. And so thus Penn's budding career included a number of interactions in which he, he ex exhibited what George Richardson called, remember, indignant feelings. Um, one might say very indignant feelings. Um, publishing nearly two dozen defenses of Quakerism in the 1670s alone. So who were some of these external uh, uh, critics? Not surprisingly, Quakers found themselves on the receiving end of a great deal of criticism from representatives of the Church of England. In 1673, Henry Halliwell, uh, an Anglican vicar from Sussex, called Quakers, quoting here, the refuse of the world. I mean, he doesn't beat around the bush. No, Penn was not the only one who had indignant feelings. Um, they came from all sides. The refuse of the world, persons of the meanest quality and lowest parts and education. They're done, it, he wasn't done. Their doctrines, he went on, quote, not only destructive of all civil polity and government, but of religion itself. Is that all? Um, uh, and the worship of Almighty God established amongst them. This is um, uh, Halliwell. Penn responded quickly with a chapter, as, as often was the case in early modern political debate, chapter by chapter uh, de uh, response, wisdom justified of her children. Several years later, Penn found himself in a pu public dispute with another Anglican clergyman, John uh, Cheney um, uh, from Cheshire. John Cheney was a busy man as well. Um, in 1676 alone, he published four anti-Quaker tracts. Um, simply, it was almost like a, a saturation bombing campaign. Now they surely won't be able to respond to all of them if I keep writing them. Um, in the skirmisher defeated, uh, so, Penn, so he wrote a skirmish on Quakerism. Penn responded with the skirmisher defeated. Penn insisted on the essentially na Protestant nature of everything that Quakers um, believed. Now these were um, uh, uh, contentious, angry exchanges, indignant feelings on both sides. Not every interaction between Quakers and Anglicans threw off such rhetorical sparks. Uh, he received a long letter from um, Henry Moore, the noted uh, Cambridge Platonist and scholar. Uh, and this letter is, is a quite remarkable uh, piece of correspondence. No invective, and instead actually a detailed and substantive engagement with Quaker principles and teachings. Imagine that. Um, he even praised, quote, the wit and seriousness um, and several excellent passages of Penn's writing. Um, it's not to say that he agreed with them. He was an Anglican, and he differed, and so on, but the tenor of this exchange. Um, what we don't know is if Penn responded. Uh, maybe he only responded to indignant uh, attacks with his own indignant feelings, and there's no, there's no extant reply. Now, uh, early in his career, uh, I mentioned uh, Richardson's book, um, uh, Defending Penn's Sandy Foundation Sh Shaken. Um, he had been accused of uh, Socinianism, thrown in the Tower of London. But in 1672, he found himself debating an actual Socinian, Henry Hedworth, um, whose spirit of the Quakers tried, attacked friends, and more particularly attacked Fox himself whom he declared, quote, a false prophet 
liar or imposter? Or and, I don't know which is which, but uh, you know, false prophet, liar, or imposter. Um, and left to Fox's defense there as well. But now all these controversies, I think, pale before those between Penn and his two chief adversaries during these years, Thomas Hicks and John Faldo. Each of, each of these disputes stretched on for numerous years. Faldo was an independent from near Barnet, uh, and, and as, as was often the case, found his congregants forsaking his own preaching to go to Quaker meetings, and this really riled him up. Um, in an attempt to stanch the flow, he produced a, 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 a monumental book, Quakerism, No Christianity. Call it like you mean it. Um, say what you mean. A 200 plus page attack described friends as quoting in here, knowing no God above that they call the light in their consciences and directly addressing friends saying you should no longer call yourself Christians. Um, they didn't take him up on his appeal. Penn's lengthy response, uh, even lengthier than the original book he was responding to, insisted that Quakerism was, as his title, a new nickname for old Christianity and went on to lament the way in which all of the dissenters were piling on the Quakers just when they should have all been celebrating their newfound liberty. His other nemesis during these years, uh, the Baptist Thomas Hicks, uh, attacked Quakers in 1673 in dialogue format, a dialogue between a Christian and a Quaker. Of course, they aren't the same things, right? There's the qu Christian here, the Quaker there, uh, in which, not surprisingly, Quaker critic after all, Christian thoroughly bested Quaker in a debate over faith and doctrine. It wasn't even close. Um, Penn collaborated with his friend George Whitehead on a response, the Christian Quaker, um, which rebutted a number of the charges made. But undeterred, Hicks produced a sequel, a continuation of the dialogue between a Christian and a Quaker, in which, once again, Christian bested Quaker. Now, in this case, debate in print led to debate in person. And Penn and Whitehead debated Baptists in October uh, 1674 in London. From all accounts, these were raucous affairs, discharging years' worth of bitterness and acrimony, and one suspects changing very few minds. Um, now, finally, uh, Penn's most, uh, highest profile debate during these years um, was surely that with Presbyterian Richard Baxter, probably the most uh, famous dissenter in the land. Um, like so many other such public disputations, the one between Penn and Baxter, which stretched on for seven hours, seven hours. On October 5th, 1675, we, I don't have a complete transcript of all seven hours, um, but it surely, like so many of these, it shed much more heat than light. Um, but what all of these disputes, both in print and in person, show, I think, is the degree to which William Penn was a key member of what we might think of as kind of a sophisticated rapid response team, a Quaker rapid response team, which was poised to spring into action to, 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 to rebut uh, criticisms coming from their religious rivals. Now, the third way in which Penn served as a boundary spanner in these years was between the Quakers and the government. Not surprisingly, given his famous name, same as his father, um, such efforts frequently operated on a national scale. In January 1678, on assignment from the meeting for sufferings, Penn and several others addressed the king and the Privy Council, um, King Charles II then, um, uh, to protest friends being prosecuted under anti-Catholic legislation, as well as appealing for permission to offer affirmations instead of oaths in legal settings. Um, in March of that same year, he testified before Parliament, again deflecting the claim that Quakers were closet Catholics, while maintaining that Catholics too deserved liberty to follow their consciences. As he put it this way, it's, it's a wonderful a little sentence here. I am far from thinking that Papists should be whipped for their conscience, because I declaim against the injustice of whipping Quakers for Papists. He also attempted to engage in electoral politics more directly by supporting his friend Algernon Sidney's unsuccessful campaign for Parliament. After Sidney's defeat, Penn even encouraged his friend to contest the results, offering to draw on his connections in Parliament to help the cause. Um, Sidney declined Penn's offer, probably wisely. There was simply, anyone knows anything about Algernon Sidney, there's no way he was going to be seated in Parliament under any condition. Um, now these are sort of national level uh, events. Although he used his connections at the royal court when necessary, Penn also realized that local authorities often had a great deal of leeway in the enforcement of laws, and so he directed uh, a great deal of effort as well at justices of the peace, sheriffs, and other local magistrates. He visited Ely during the fall of 1671 and composed um, a, a wonderful 
blistering attack on the conduct of two justices of the peace there for their actions, which would include physical assault on elderly friends, fines, destruction of friends' property, leading their horses into the meeting house, and then encouraging their horses to leave droppings, to put it nicely. Um, uh, really outrageous behavior that Penn detailed, um, made a detailed uh, response to. He sent copies of his own writings to Middlesex magistrates in 1674, and he reminded them that they always had the option. This is one of the interesting things about 17th century administration of justice. Local authorities really were the point at which enforcement happened or didn't happen. Penn said you could always just look the other way. Right? You could perhaps offer what he called, quote, some gentle caution for the future. Perhaps most fundamentally, though, he told these magistrates in Middlesex, um, quote here, you have work enough to do to employ yourselves about in executing all laws that recover and preserve morality, mercy, justice, sobriety, and godly living, rather than harassing sober and industrious dissenters. So now, not only did all of these boundary-spanning activities I've been talking about enable Penn to play a key role in the development of Quakerism and in dealings with the government, they also provided connections on which he would later draw in his colonization efforts. So by the end of the 1670s, he'd observed either firsthand or nearly firsthand the complexities of migration and resettlement in a number of different settings. In Ireland, where he had spent five years during his youth and to which he had later returned uh, to manage his father's estates, developing friendships with, um, oh, so William Petty's coming in a, in a later slide. Um, he had taken part, admittedly, at some distance in laying the foundations for the American colony of New Jersey. Um, and his travels through the Palatinate had taught him that migration might take place from the east rather than the west. So from the local meeting to the intersections of English and Dutch Quakerism, Penn had clearly arrived as a leading Quaker in England and increasingly a figure known across Europe uh, as well. Now I've discussed the 1670s at some length. Uh, I'm not going to spend the this similar level of detail in the rest of his life. We'd be here till midnight. Um, I could, but I won't. Um, uh, I would be delighted, but you would not be delighted. Um, it's a crucial decade, though, in laying the foundation for the remainder of his career, so I'd like to move at a slightly brisker pace from, near on, from here on, here on in, and look at the ways in which he continued to span boundaries over subsequent years. Now this famous, highly apocryphal, but really lovely photo of, uh, painting of, of Penn receiving the Charter of Pennsylvania. Of course, the king removing his hat because only one person can be wearing a hat in the presence of a king. It's one of these wonderful apocryphal stories, uh, makes for a great uh, image. Um, the 1680s added another set of connections to Penn's public life, beginning with colonization efforts in Pennsylvania and continuing during his embrace of James II's tolerationist agenda later in the decade. Now, after a difficult period in the wake of the 1688 revolution, Penn reemerged in the, in the mid 1690s after being in seclusion, in prison, and in hiding played an important role in unifying and representing those with colonial interests, adding yet another boundary-spanning activity to his already extensive portfolio. <clears throat> oh, Pennsylvania first. William Penn first petitioned for an American territory in June 1680. Over the next nine months, his plea worked its way through the Byzantine structures of English government. Um, after he received his colonial charter in March 1681, establishing the political and the economic foundations of his colony, led Penn to engagement with a wide variety of audiences. He circulated drafts of his governing documents <clears throat> to associates both within and outside the Society of Friends, Thomas Rudyard, Benjamin Furley, and uh, Sidney. In early 1682, he offered a series of concessions to his first purchasers to entice investment in and emigration uh, to Pennsylvania. And he soon had a network of agents in place which drew on his existing uh, pre-existing con connections to facilitate sales of land. He had Philip Ford in London, uh, Barclay in Scotland, Robert Turner in Dublin, Benjamin Furley in Rotterdam, uh, James Harrison in Lancashire, so he had the ground covered. And of course the urban centers of European Quakerism, London, Dublin, Bristol, Rotterdam, Cork, all places where Penn had visited or spent time over the past decade or so were heavily represented among his first purchases. So boundary spanning can be a profitable uh, quality as well. And once he arrived in Pennsylvania in October 1682, 
one of the most important pieces of business was to establish a system of Quaker meetings throughout the province. By the following spring, each of the three counties in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, uh, Bucks, and um, Chester had its own men's and women's monthly meetings, and the first Philadelphia yearly meeting took place in 1683. So in addition to his various other boundaries, um, he added the role of spanning English and American Quakerism. And there were other transatlantic boundaries to span um, as well. Penn's status as a fellow of the Royal Society, aided by his friendship with society fellows, Sir William Petty, Petty there, uh, John Aubrey and Robert Boyle. This is the um, frontispiece of Spratt's History of the Royal Society. And uh, this is the map uh, that was presented on Penn's behalf when he was uh, admitted as a member of the Royal Society, a uh, map of some of the south and east boundaries of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, his friendship with these fellows and his membership in the society enabled him to keep his colony fresh in the minds of an influential segment of English society. The society, the Royal Society, considered Penn a kind of resident correspondent in American territory. And he sent back detailed descriptions and maps and uh, other uh, sorts of information. <clears throat> now, his attempts to work with other colonial proprietors, I'm sorry for the pale, uh, paleness of the, of the image there, um, Yet another boundary he attempted to span were, ra we might just say, rather less successful um, of, the, of the boundary spanning activities. A bitter dispute with his southern neighbor would send him back to London just two years after he arrived. But Baltimore was hardly the only colonial figure with whom Penn found himself at odds during his first visit to America. He became embroiled in difficulties with, with his neighbors in the Jerseys, east and west, an outcome made all the more painful by the fact that nearly all of the principals in the dispute were friends. And that didn't, that didn't save them from his indignant feelings either. Uh, as 1683 wore on, Penn became aware of rumors circulating in England about him and his colony. He was dead. He was Catholic. Not, not sure which would have been a worse thing to be true about him. Um, that the colony was embroiled in a, in a, in a war and armed hostilities with Maryland. Um, he traced these rumors back to West Jersey residents viewing them, rightly it seems, as an attempt to scare settlers away from Pennsylvania to West Jersey, right? Um, nor were his relations with his northern neighbor, New York, free from conflict either. In the summer of 1683, Penn turned his attention to the Susquehanna Valley, which, uh, in the words of uh, Gary Nash, not only watered a vast region highly suitable for agricultural development, but also held the key to the coveted Iroquois fur trade. But the newly arrived governor of New York, Thomas Dongan, understood the strategic importance of, in, of his own retention of the control of the Iroquois fur trade, and he put a stop to um, all negotiations with the natives. Now, after his return to England in 1684, the accession of James II paved the way for Penn to wield influence at the absolute pinnacle of English politics, to expand on and build upon and expand upon his already extensive networks and connections. He clearly saw his continued presence in England, which was clearly detrimental to his role in retaining control in Pennsylvania, as serving a number of important purposes for liberty of conscience, for better treatment of English friends, and for sheltering Pennsylvania from the Crown's increasing attempts to assert direct control over the colonies. He wrote back to Pennsylvania, my being here has not only advanced the reputation of the province and gained many great persons into our interest, but prevented a storm that is falling upon other colonies. And it's true, other colonies, Massachusetts and New Jersey, um, were experiencing difficulties. Penn's proximity to the levers of power also enabled him to press the king for particular leniency to friends. And in his more overtly political capacity, he engaged in personal negotiations on behalf of the king, assisting in efforts to remove local office holders who resisted James' efforts to impose toleration. Now, of course, while all this was going on, he remained a prominent and an influential friend. As a member of the Meeting for Sufferings, he continued to seek relief from penal legislation for friends who found themselves under attack by local magistrates. In late 1686, he toured northern and western England and wrote back to Pennsylvania friends, quote, meetings never larger or better. He retained a number of important connections with Dutch Quakers, and they actually enabled him to further his efforts on behalf of toleration in England. In the summer of 1686, James sent Penn to consult with William of Orange, a, a diplomatic mission that Penn disguised by attending the yearly meeting in Amsterdam 
while he was there. Then again, after the revolution of 1688, Penn faced a backlash, a severe backlash within the Society of Friends, many of whom felt that the very thing that had made Penn such a prominent and influential advocate during James's reign, his boundary-spanning roles and his close relationship to the king, had brought them into disrepute. Um, he encountered particularly vociferous criticism from his old uh, co-defendant, William Meade. Penn's second marriage in 1695 to Hannah Calville, ah, there they are, um, was a boundary-spanning move of its own in some ways, brought together one of the pillars of London Quakerism and one of the most prominent and prosperous Bristol Quaker families. One of the ways that you get yourself out of debt is you have a very wealthy father-in-law. Um, and this is the, the, the genius behind Penn's second marriage. Not that he wasn't in love with her as well, he clearly was. Um, very touching love letters, in fact. And in 1698, he undertook a long deferred return to Ireland. It had been three decades since he'd been there. Um, about a week after his arrival, Penn and three other friends uh, published a brief pamphlet called Gospel Truths, laying out the essential principles of Quakerism. Um, this work was animated by what, he just, what uh, Thomas Story in his journal describes as a quote, coarse and scurrilous attack on friends by Baptist John Plimpton, who replied to the Gospel Truths pamphlet with his own called A Quaker No Christian, to which Penn, Story, and Everett responded, wait for it, A Quaker A Christian. So we have A Quaker No Christian, A Quaker A Christian. It says, I, I, I raised two boys and I know all about, yes you did, no I didn't, yes you are, no I'm not. Uh, it sounds something like that. Um, so as he re-entered political life during the mid-1690s, Penn's ability to bridge rival factions was put really to its ultimate test. Much of his time was spent in nearly constant attempts to fend off challenges to his proprietorship, it tended to come from one of two places, either from Pennsylvania Anglicans or royal authorities, or Pennsylvania Quakers themselves. He, he pleaded with Pennsylvania Quakers, please crack down on smuggling, provide funds for colonial defense if you don't want the crown to reassert direct control over us. Now caught between these two powerful forces, uh, royal control and uh, disobedient Pennsylvania Quakers, Penn drew on every connection available to him and he worked to defend his colony interest, <coughs> colony's interest. Um, oh, we're getting, up, getting there in just a moment. Um, uh, his chief rival in this effort was Edward Randolph, the King's Surveyor General of Customs for North American Colonies, whom the Board of Trade charged with investigating com colonial compliance with the Trade and Navigation Act. In early 1697, Randolph presented the results of his investigation, and Pennsylvania came in for particularly hostile treatment. The question really was, are they corrupt or are they incompetent? And that's a question you don't really want to have to answer about yourself. Right? There's really not a, not a way to, to answer that that doesn't put you in a bad light. But proprietors and colonial agents um, did not take Randolph's charges lying down. And so during the second half of the 1690s, Penn played an increasingly prominent role in rallying opposition to Randolph. The editors of Penn's papers describe him as, quote, the de facto leader of the proprietors and agents of the non-royal colonies. They also call him, quote, the only proprietor with the necessary interest, energy, and influence to do battle with the Board of Trade. Penn's correspondence with Fitzjohn Winthrop, grandson of the famous uh, Massachusetts Bay founder, who was then in London serving as an agent for the Connecticut colony, makes clear that others in London look to him for leadership in the search to preserve colonial uh, colonies autonomy. Early in 1697, Winthrop wrote to Penn, quote, we are flushed with success under your conduct in our general affair. Now one more way in which Penn attempted to span boundaries during this year, these years was thinking about ways to unite the colonies around their com common interest and allegiance and to enhance their common prosperity and thus enhance their value to the crown. He laid out some of these ideas in his 1697 Brief and Plain Scheme, proposing a system of intercolonial cooperation and governance. He also looked beyond the colonial context and presented the Lords Justices of Ireland with his views on improving the, English, uh, the Irish um, economy. Let's, let's hasten him on to his, well, I was say his demise, that would be a little uh, inappropriate. Let's hasten him on to the, the fullness of his career. Return to Pennsylvania, 16, uh, 1699. Now by the time Penn departed England for his long delayed return to Pennsylvania in 1699, his struggle with the Board of Trade had gone on for the better part of a decade. The board ordered him to remove a number of the colony's leading politicians from office, which he did, 
but those were actions which poisoned his already fractious relationship um, with his own colonists. In America, he continued his efforts at bringing together representatives of the colonies to advance their interests vis-a-vis -vis the crown and to fend off encroachments on their affairs. And here again, his capacity for boundary spanning and bridge building served him well. He wrote to Virginia Governor Francis Nicholson, I desire with all sincerity a good understanding among the governors of the provinces and the prosperity of the respective provinces. To the governor of Maryland, he professed his desire to pursue friendly relations, to be dutiful to the crown, careful of its revenues, and the good of the mother country. He expressed similar sentiments to Sir William Beeston, Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica, or to the governor of Barbados, Captain General of the Leeward Islands, and again to Winthrop of Connecticut. He maintained cordial correspondence with the Dickinson brothers, Jonathan and Caleb, prosperous and slaveholding friends from Jamaica who visited Philadelphia. And he even convened in October 1700 a governor's conference with the head of his neighboring governments, proposed a number of measures to advance trade in the colonies and asked for a standardization of law and practice across the colonies and asked Penn then to convey these proposals to the Board of Trade, which he promptly did and which they promptly ignored. Um, again, not surprising. Um, so his history as a boundary spanner and his extensive personal and political <coughs> networks that facilitated his effort to maintain control of his colony into the 18th century. He's well acquainted with Robert Harley, Speaker of the House of Commons, as well as with Lord Manchester, Secretary of State and Commissioner on the Board of Trade. And each of these made sure that Penn's interests were fully represented. Uh, he, did, he, of course, remained an active uh, Quaker in the capital as well as Sussex, um, was uh, part of a company of friends who met Queen Anne at Windsor Castle in 1702 um, to, quote, assure her on behalf of all our friends of our sincere affection and Christian obedience. Uh, the Queen apparently replied to Penn personally, Mr. Penn, I am well pleased that what I have done is to your satisfaction, that you and your friends may be assured of my protection, and my protection, sorry, my protection. Um, she, he had known the Queen um, uh, since she was Princess Anne, daughter of his uh, friend James II. Now, after returning to England in 1701 with the passage of time, with Penn's increasing ill health and financial woes, he became increasingly despondent um, about his ability to wield any influence at all. And he was unable to rally any opposition to the occasional conformity bill, which passed in 1711. He lamented in a letter to Harley, I am heartily sorry. I am now good for nothing. It was other ways in former days. And it wasn't long after that that the stroke um, that I mentioned um, failed him. So let me just make a few concluding remarks and then open up for questions and conversation. <clears throat> First of all, as I think has been clear in my discussion tonight, the sorts of relationships and connections that enable some individuals to become successful boundary spanners are not merely sites of communication, connection, and facilitation. They also exist enmeshed in relationships of power. Now, within the Society of Friends, Penn's role as a key supporter of George Fox aligned him with the forces of centralization, systematization, we might even say orthodoxy. While in English society at large, his role as a Quaker spokesman placed him on the receiving end of jailing and fines. William Penn was, in one sense, an extraordinarily privileged individual. His father's connections in the Navy, in the English government, in Ireland, made Penn no ordinary convert, but a valuable asset in Quaker efforts to defend themselves in public debate against a wide range of foes. That said, of course, Penn as a Quaker entered public life as the rep representative of a despised group of dissenters, subject to the exercise of state power as well as violent popular animosity. So these power dimensions uh, of all of Penn's activity mm -hmm. I think are worth keeping in mind as we move towards a more holistic understanding of his rich and varied career. Secondly. I suggested this evening that Penn's boundary spanning is one of the things that makes him so fascinating as a, history, as a figure in the history of Quakerism. Yet it's also precisely the thing that caused him such difficulty during his career. Penn's role in promoting James's efforts at toleration was, in one sense, a quintessential example of boundary spanning. A well-known public figure playing on his prominent social profile and lending the power of his affiliation to a politically ambitious monarch in order to pursue a shared goal. But unlike James, Penn could not escape to France when the whole thing came crashing down in spectacular fashion in December of 1688. He remained in England, had to reckon with the political consequences of choosing the losing side of the revolution. 
I'd mentioned the hostility that he faced from within the, the Society of Friends, who felt that his close association with such a partisan political campaign had besmirched their reputation. Finally, thirdly, there was one boundary that William Penn could never quite span, the boundary with his own colonists, perhaps ironically, perhaps not. After his first departure in 1684, the correspondence between Penn and his government took on an increasingly sharp edge. And I've argued elsewhere in a paper I gave a couple weeks ago that one might look at Pennsylvania Quakers as effectively reading Penn out of their meeting, just two years after its founding. Now this ouster may not have displayed all the hallmarks of Fox's gospel order, visits by committee of friends, uh, formal admonition and censure, eventual disownment, but it was just as surely a highly effective exercise of power, leaving Penn sidelined with little control over events in quote unquote his own colony, just a handful of years after its founding. Now he was hardly unique in this regard, proprietors and settlers tangled in almost all the American colonies, but in all his planning, in the heady days of 1681-82, I suspect that Penn ne likely never contemplated the notion that his own interests and those of his colonists could diverge in such a radical way. So now in my recent work on William Penn, and particularly in the biography that's forthcoming this fall, I've been struck by the contradictory and paradoxical nature of his career, its many twists and turns, and his simultaneous uh, capacity to combine high ideals and a really ruthless pragmatism. I've tried to lay out tonight the way I see the notion of boundary spanning as making some sense of these various characteristics and tendencies. Of course, as we move towards marking the 300th anniversary of Penn's death, July 30th of this year, there's a great deal more to be said. He figured into so many aspects of the early modern world and continues to cast a long shadow even today. Thank you.